esteemed honor to have Miranda here from Amudin in Baltimore. He is the Meshkiach of the TA Middle School, counselor as well, and director of education for Amudin. Um, got Smicha from Mary Israel, went there for 12 years, as well as got his um, master's in counseling from Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and is a licensed clinical professor, professional counselor and has been practicing since 2013 in counseling for adolescents and adults. So the girls today and the CTA high school students had such an incredible opportunity to talk and to listen and learn, and I hope we can continue that and bring it forward to our community. Thank you. Is it free? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, yes, I did have an amazing time with all the kids today, uh, both at CTA and at the girls' school with a lot of interactivity, some fun stuff that we did, which I'll share. What I want to accomplish for tonight is I'd like to give over to you as parents some of the main concepts that I already gave over to your children, to the children in the community. And I think the best way for kids to ever learn anything is through repetition, through hearing the same things over and over again, sometimes with different flavors, different ways of saying it, and for me to be able to share with all of you, all the parents, the ways in which we approach some of these topics, I think is crucial for the children to then hear it again from you. So, and as much as I'm here to learn together with you, but also my hope is that you'll take the lessons that we learned today and actually engage your children in these conversations. That is gonna be the beginning and end of this presentation how important it is for us to effectively, non-judgmentally, be able to communicate with our children and educate our children, plant positive seeds without being confrontational, etc. So I wanna be able to share with you what we spoke about because it allows you to then go and follow up. Oh yeah, I heard there was this Rabbi Lanza there, I heard you spoke about this or that, did you do this or that, it sounds like it was fun, it sounds like it was educational, tell me more about it, and it opens the door in an easy way as soon as possible doesn't have to be tonight per se, but the sooner the better to be able to open up that conversation and nothing has to be accomplished in any one conversation with your children. Baruch Hashem, you have many years with your children and so you can start the conversation, open the door in the right way and then the conversations can continue. And the reason I start with that is because, especially when we're dealing with teenagers, but really if you can start way younger than that, that's much better. If children feel that that's the way we operate in our home, we talk about anything and everything without any judge, being judgmental at all. And you're not gonna be punished by sharing something with me and, and all the other tips that we'll get to. So if you do that already from a very young age, then it's something which has a much easier time making inroads in the style of the family, in the ways in which the child is comfortable bringing things up to their parents. And that is the number one predictive factor for children uh, being saved from a lot of the issues that we're gonna talk about tonight. The number one factor is having someone in their lives that they feel like they can be open with, completely open with. And the best possible person for that is parents. Sometimes the kid themselves will choose somebody else other than the parents, that's fine, but having someone that they can be open with. And we want to try to allow one of those options to be the parents. So the way that I like to open this conversation is by asking children, and I'll ask all of you, is it logical, or is there a line of reasoning and logic that would justify using substances, over drinking, using drugs? Is there any line of reasoning and logic that would make that make sense to the person using? What do you think? Anybody think there's a line of logic to that? Using it all or overusing? Overusing. Overusing. Mm -hmm. Over already implies. So the answer to that question has to be yes. Let me say it in a little bit of a catchy way without being so perfectly accurate. It is logical to, to do drugs. Well, that sounds pretty crazy, right? And don't just make a little TikTok snap. <laughs> that um, it is logical to do, do, do drugs, meaning the reason why people do drugs and the reason why they drink too much and all these things is because it does something and we have to start with that understanding. If we start 
the, with the assumption, and then therefore how we start our conversation with, it's ridiculous and you're damaging yourself and it's destructive, how could you do that? If, God forbid, a parent ever says to their child, I don't want to ever hear that from you again, not a curse word, it's revealing that they're thinking about doing something, that they heard about this and they're curious about it. You, they mentioned marijuana. I don't want to ever hear you mention that again. Well, then the child's message that the child gets is, okay, if I have curiosity or, and I decide maybe I want to experiment with it, I will try to respect your wishes and not tell you. That's the message you're giving them. So what we want is to make sure that we foster that open communication, but we also we have to start with the idea that the substances have logic to them. Otherwise, no one would ever do them. It's not psychotic people who decide to abuse substances. By psychotic, I mean truly textbook definition like completely insane. It's actually quite sane people who tend to abuse substances. Why are they doing it? What's the logic? Because they're missing. They're missing something underneath. They're missing either, some say, that what's the opposite of addiction? Not sobriety, but connection. So some will say they're missing deep and real connection with family members, with friends. And so many times when we approach it that way, providing connection, I told the kids, I'm not saying any of you struggle, I told them, but how many people here know of a friend, another person, you're close with, you're not so close with, who has struggled or is struggling. Every child raised their hands in both schools. Every child. They know someone. So I said, assuming we're not all talking about the one single person who everyone happens to know, right? Everyone knows a bunch of people that are struggling in these areas. It's common, unfortunately. It's common enough that everyone knows someone. And of course, there could be some people in the audience too. I'm just not gonna ask them to raise their hands. So when we're talking about being able to be a friend and help them, we have to start with what's going on? What are they missing? What's, what's the logic? Not not stop, you're destroying yourself, that's crazy, but rather, wait, there must be a why. Let me try to figure it out with you and see if I can help you with that why. And if it's loneliness and if it's lack of acceptance in peer groups, maybe I can help you as a teacher, as a parent, as a friend even, right? Maybe as a friend you would go over to that person after understanding that and say, hey, would you like to come over and join the group that we're having at my house today to do with the project? But what does that have to do with the fact that they're struggling with vaping or even marijuana or drinking? It might have everything to do with it. That might be the whole thing that's driving them to do it because that's their escape. That's their shortcut escape. It could be mental health issues, sometimes intense anxiety, sadness and depression, sometimes other mental health diagnoses are not being treated. It takes a truly strong and brave person to say, you know what, I need help. Not only do I need help with my knee that's hurting, it's like a part of my body, and also I can't really ignore it at any time, and no one's gonna tell me with my knee, oh, come on, just get over it. What do you mean, I smashed my knee into the ground, and it's injured. So to be able to say, no, 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 also my character, who, a little bit more deeply who I am, I need help. It's much more personal, it's much more difficult to admit that to yourself and certainly to another person. So going and seeking out therapy can be so difficult. But that's what we need, we need the people to do. The person has to go and be willing to make themselves vulnerable enough to seek out therapy, to be able to get help, to be able to open up to someone and say, I need help, can you help me find a therapist? Just on that note, I wanna just say a quick idea about Amudim, I was discussing with some people before. Amudim is an organization based out of New York, but it has international reach. They have an Israeli, Israel organization as well. And they help communities all around America. If I could get the CEO of Tzvi Glock on the phone right now, I believe it's in Israel. But if I could, I'm sure he could tell me exactly, he knows all the stuff, he has all the data on his phone, exactly how many cases he's treated in Columbus from which zip codes over the last five years. He's not going to share identifying details, but he can, he can tell me. That's usually when he comes to the communities with me, that's what he likes to share, just to make sure you're all aware that you're not immune to these problems. So, but Amudim is there primarily as a case management organization. That means that instead of just having 
Rabbanim and teachers and parents and community members who say, oh, I know of this therapist and that therapist, that might be a good idea, why don't you call them? You call Amudin free of charge, you can stay anonymous, and a case manager handles your call 100% with you. They handle your call and they're willing to say, okay, here's first, every case manager in Amudin is a licensed mental health professional, and here is what I would recommend. Try this or try that. Not because I'm your therapist, just initial steps, and also I think you need a therapist, so we'll also then be the referral agency and help you find a therapist. And then after the first session of therapy, when maybe, which is often, I didn't feel like I clicked with that therapist, they said something weird that made me feel strange, that case manager could say, yeah, that was strange, you should go to someone else, here's another idea. Or, no, that's pretty typical for a first session, you should try again. And generally speaking, referral agencies are not doing that. They're not holding the hand of the client to make sure that they're getting the services they need in the mental health area. So just to understand a little bit, besides for these awareness and educational events in the schools and for the community, that's really a primary thing they do and you should never hesitate to call. They're there to help you and to help people in the community. So getting back to what we were saying, there's logic to it. There's a reason for the decision and we have to make sure that we start with that assumption. There's a reason why this person is choosing to abuse that substance. And once we approach it that way, then we're looking for, is there a mental health disorder? Is there a loneliness? Is there a lack of acceptance? Is there some other source of stress in their life that they're not handling at a healthy level? So now that we've approached it with that assumption, first of all, it's much more comfortable for the person. Like, I'm not screaming at you, why are you destroying yourself, stop. I'm here, I want to listen. And listening is the first tool that every therapist uses. A good therapist, the first session could be just asking a couple of questions and listening the rest of the time. But like real listening. So somebody says something to me and I paraphrase it back for them. Somebody says to me, it was really hard when I was growing up, uh, I was in this school and I had to move. And after they finish that paragraph, I say, so, so you're saying that when you were that age, you had to move two times from this place to that place, and each time just when you were making friends, and, I'm, and they're like, yeah. Just that one little act already is actually one of the healthy coping mechanisms, which is speaking it out and feeling like you're heard, feeling a little connection to someone who just wants to hear your story. They just want to listen. Not being judgmental, just hear the details, show you that they're really listening and understanding. So that's what we want to do. If it's our own children, it can be even more challenging. But even more so, it's important to not react instantly to what they say. How many people here in your own minds could imagine, Chas Rishon, God forbid, your own child coming home and telling you, I just tried marijuana for the first time today. What's your reaction? That's really hard to imagine, hopefully, and hopefully will never happen. But if you could imagine it, it's really hard to stay calm in that moment. But actually one of the most important things you can do, and the child is reading your every single little face twitch the moment they reveal something. I'm just giving you a little bit more of an extreme example. It can be countless examples that are more realistic for some. And they wanna see, are you gonna react with, what? How did this happen? Meaning, you destroyed yourself, you destroyed your life, let me use a lot of those languages and scare tactics to make sure you never do it again. Scaring doesn't work. There was, a, there was a program that they used to do in America, and I think they made a TV show out of it, so they might still do it in one capacity or another. I'm not sure if it's the real thing anymore. But they used to actually bring inner city kids to prisons in the elementary and middle school age groups to go meet maximum security prisoners in the prisons. And they basically tell the kids, that's going to be you if you don't shape up. And they did data and surveys over the course of many years and found zero change in the kids that had the scared straight program and the kids that did not. Because just frightening a kid, maybe in the moment, you can, it could sort of be like an inspiration for a, a moment. But if, if it's not followed up with a lot of love and support, then it's not going to last. And many times, even if it is followed up with a lot of love and support, if the scaring was the whole thing, and it showed how scared you were and how disappointed and devastated you are, all the love and support afterwards is going to be mitigated by that first approach.
approach that first, you know, as much as we feel like that's not fair, look at all the time I spent after. We have to be careful with our initial reactions. I'm not saying it's all over if you do it. And in fact, one of the best ways to correct for that type of thing is to quickly go back to the child and say, you know, within a few minutes, within an hour, I realized I reacted pretty harshly to that. I'm sorry, it was just a surprise and a shock. I wasn't ready for it. Can I try again? That itself is a very powerful intervention. It's like, yeah, we can make mistakes too. Give me another chance. You're asking me for second chances all the time. So let me have another chance and let me try to do this the right way. And you stay calm and non-judgmental. And you say, first of all, I want to tell you, I'm so proud of you that you told me. It's amazing that you told me. I'm so proud of you. You could have easily not told me. What does it take to not tell? And instead, you built up the courage to tell me, thank you. I'm so proud of you. And when we think about it, and we kind of separate our emotions out of it, that is something to be very proud of. It's not, it's not like exaggerating. That's really true. So we want to give that message over to the children because we want them to tell us if other things happen. We want them to tell us if they're thinking about doing certain things. So that's the approach that we want to take, recognizing that there are reasons and there are real stressors and pressures for the children to want to experiment with these things. So once we take that approach and it's not judgmental and it's, we stay calm and it's not just reacting at the situation, so what can we do to help the children? So we already spoke about connection, trying to offer some connection. But in general, what we want to do is offer healthy coping mechanisms for dealing with stress in life, because that's one of the biggest reasons why people will experiment and ultimately get hooked on substances. You will have teenagers who will just kind of, for the thrill of it, experiment. It generally doesn't last for too long, or they try it a couple of times and then they get addicted, and now it becomes itself a source of stress for them. But it causes them to start, the, the definition of addiction is it's causing dysfunction in your life. The substance is causing that dysfunction. They're losing friends and they're not doing well academically. And all these stressors are building. In fact, let's talk about alcohol for a second, which is legal for adults. Let's talk about alcohol for adults. The number one absolute worst time for an adult to ever drink alcohol is when they're in a bad mood or stressed out, which is the number one time that adults generally consider drinking alcohol. Because if like they're just having a nice dinner out with their spouse and it's like a nice evening and they're like, let's have a glass of wine, it will enhance the evening. That's one thing. But if you, that's just like an enhancement. But if you use the alcohol as a medication, as the unhealthy coping mechanism, then that much more quickly becomes addictive in nature. Because again, there's all these lines of reasoning now as to why it makes sense for me to use it. It takes me out of my misery, out of my stress. So we want to make sure that we can convey these ideas to our children and understand what are the underlying stressors that are causing them to use these substances. And some healthy coping mechanisms. Your kids came up with amazing ideas, right? Writing down your feelings. With the girls, that's an easy one. With the boys, much harder. I tell the boys, if you'd like, we don't have to call it a diary. We can call it a journal instead. And I encourage them very strongly to write, to write a little bit. Sometimes with the boys, you know, I tell this to the girls also, but sometimes with the boys, it's very important to tell them. So you're gonna sit there at your desk in your room and you're gonna write, right? What's one of the things you're afraid of? Someone's gonna find my notes, no problem. Here's the coping mechanism. Write down your feelings, write down what happened, write down why it's making you upset. Just getting it off your chest through talking or even writing. Dr. David Falkovitz, famous uh, orthodox psychologist, he talks about what's called naming the monster. That means that when we have feelings and stressors in our head, they, they're very abstract and they bother us a lot. But when we put them into words, words themselves by definition are confining. They limit, to, for better or worse, in this case for better, they limit the concepts. And so they actually give structure to the concepts and allow us to deal with them much more capably. That's part of why therapy works through speaking out and putting words to the issues that are swirling around in my mind. So, Write it down, write down what you're feeling, and then rip up the paper into a million pieces. The second you finish writing, burn it up into ashes if you need. It doesn't matter, it's not about keeping it. Now if you do keep it, it can be an amazing intervention to revisit some of those earlier pages in your notebook from a month or two ago where you wrote, there's no way I'm ever gonna survive, I am completely ruined, there's nothing that could help me. 
And a month later, you're like, what was that about again? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, I got over that. Like, oh, interesting. I got over that. Maybe I can get over this, too. There's interesting new insights that you can get by writing. But even if you don't do that, just ripping it up afterwards. These are, this is a real, tangible intervention you can share with your children. You don't need to go to a therapist to hear this idea. And this is something that's powerful. Not other ideas, right? Breathing exercises, which revolves really a lot around both physiologically, okay, increasing the oxygen flow in our blood and to our brains, which clears the mind. But also, it, it connects to the concept, this popular concept in psychology called mindfulness. Mindfulness is just all about grounding ourselves in the present. Because the majority of anxieties and things we're angry about and things we're sad about are, are revolving around the future and the past, not the present. If a person has a current injury and is throbbing in pain right now, that's present. But outside of that, most of the emotional stuff we're dealing with are future and past. I can't believe that happened yesterday, replaying it in my mind. I'm so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, thinking about it over and over and over again in my mind. Whereas if we could ground ourselves in the present, it actually gets our brain to slow down and be able to cope with some of the difficult emotions we're talking about. So this, all these things are for all ages, by the way. So mindfulness, so breathing, focusing on our breathing, we normally don't focus on our breathing. If we did focus on our breathing at all times, every time we took a breath, that would look like and I wouldn't be able to talk to you. So it's good for us not to focus on our breathing, or need to focus on our breathing, but we can choose to do it to ground ourselves in the present. That's a practical strategy you can share. So sure, there's the four, seven, eight, you know, inhale for four seconds, hold it for seven seconds, exhale for eight seconds, and, and, and the belly should move in and out for the breathing, and all sorts of techniques for maximizing the productivity of the breathing exercise. But just make it simple. As a parent, you can share with your child, Try just breathing for 60 seconds, deep, slow breaths, and focus on it. Try to writing down your feelings. Do you want to talk about it? These are incredibly powerful interventions that you as parents, and, and not in the context of, oh no, you're angry, remember the rule we made, you must go and, but rather, I could see something's really bothering you, like empathize, I could see it's really bothering you right now. Uh, Maybe if I was in your place, I would feel the same angry. Let's try to dial it down a little bit, see if you could do one of these exercises, just to calm down a little bit, and then let's talk about it. Then let's try to solve it. I want to be on your side. It could be very powerful. I tell the, again, boys more often than girls, but I tell both the boys and the girls, um, the first thing, what's the first thing you're gonna think about when you're in the middle of being angry or in a bad mood? And you have this thought pop into your head. If your parents remind you, remember that thing where Lambda told you about breathing exercises or about uh, writing your feelings down and you're in the midst of being angry and you're in a bad mood, what's the first thing you're gonna think? Those are dumb ideas, they're definitely not gonna work. So just make sure you remember, I called it already. That's what you're going to think and you should do them anyway. Because when you're in a bad mood, everything's gonna be dumb. Everything's gonna be futile. Nothing's gonna help me. So you have to be ready for that and say, okay, but what do I have to lose? It'll take 60 seconds, let's see if it helps. And very often if they do it for 60 seconds, it helps a little bit and encourages them to do it a little bit more. So teaching and repeating and giving over healthy coping mechanisms is like the core of what we can do as parents for our children within the context of non-judgmentalism and empathy and patience and never reacting in the moment. In that context, we're giving our children the greatest safeguard against experimenting with these substances, being able to stand up to sometimes seeing friends glorifying the substances to be able to say, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm good. Because we're giving them that messaging, don't go there, here are actual things that you can do, and tell me everything, I'm never gonna judge you. Okay, so those are some basic coping mechanisms. Let's go over just a little bit quickly some of the different common substances out there that children, teenagers, and adults struggle with, and let's just understand them because it's important to understand exactly the makeup of these. The first one I wanna discuss is one that's often misunderstood, which is vaping. 
Vaping is, instead of smoking a cigarette, using fire and combustion to burn the materials in the cigarette and bring smoke into the lot. This puts all the five dirty and terrible poisonous byproducts that come along with that. Vaping is using electricity to vaporize the liquid. And in that liquid is the nicotine. Sometimes there's no nicotine in the liquid and there's flavorings. So that's vaping. Now, many people I've heard try to approach this topic from the position of there are dangerous chemicals in the flavorings. So there's something called diacetyl, which is a flavoring that provides grape-like flavor to vape liquids. And diacetyl is associated with popcorn lungs because it is a chemical that's used in the flavoring of microwave popcorn. And in one of the microwave popcorn factories, the factory workers were not wearing the masks and a lot of the powder from the diacetyl got into the air and got into their lungs and caused scarring on their lungs, which became known as popcorn lungs because it's association with working in the popcorn factory. And they put that chemical, so it's perfectly healthy to eat in the quantities that some of the particles are getting into your nose and mouth in the popcorn itself. Even if you stick your face into that freshly made microwave popcorn bag and breathe in as hard as you can, it's minuscule and doesn't affect you at all. But when it's put in concentrated liquid form in the vape liquid and vaporized and put into the lungs, then it's like that vat of powder in the factory and it can be dangerous. The reason I don't like going down that path with kids is because there are many companies that will like advertise, we do not use diacetyl in our flavorings. Like, oh, Rabbi Landa, what about Juul? Juul says that they don't use it. So but yeah, you have to deal with the reality. Some of them are not using it. So what I'd like to focus on instead of that is the nicotine a little bit we'll get to, but that not so much, but rather what's the base of the vape liquid? It's important to know this, it's basic, basic idea. When, when people vape, they want the experience of smoking. That's part of the reason why they're vaping. They want thick smoke coming in and out of their mouth and lungs. That's the feeling they're looking for, many times the look they're looking for. And the base of the liquid is propylene glycol. It's not water. These are not H2O water-based liquids. It's propylene glycol. Propylene glycol is a safe chemical to eat and a dangerous and unhealthy chemical to inhale. It is actually used uh, as a coating on top of some produce to preserve freshness. So it's FDA approved for that. But to inhale, it's not safe and it's dangerous. And every single teenager I've ever worked with who has vaped for some time, we're not talking about years, months, sometimes weeks, will come back to me and admit to me, and I'll ask them because I've learned to ask this question just to do my own anecdotal research, how's it going at recess? Well, I used to really like playing full court basketball at recess, but now it's all half court basketball. Why? What happened? I just get out of breath much faster. You're smoking cigarettes? No, only vaping. Every teenager. So yeah, they could say, well, I'm doing a cost-benefit analysis and I just really like the vaping better than the full court basketball. You could say that, but one thing you can't deny, your lungs have changed since you started vaping. What's, what's happening? You see the effects in a short time. What's happening? Propylene glycol is bad for the lungs and the base of every single vape liquid. If any of the base of the liquids was water, it would look the same as on a cold winter night you breathe out and you have very thin little steam coming out of your mouth. That's mostly water. But propylene glycol is that thick smoke that comes out of the vape. So that's a simple thing to know. As far as nicotine, nicotine is highly addictive. Some say more addictive in nature and physical withdrawal symptoms than even opiates and heroin. Nicotine is highly addictive. And we have to understand that also the teenage brain is much more vulnerable than the adult brain. The adult brain generally actually starts mid-20s, not 18 or 21, but on average mid-20s. And as long as the brain is still developing in its initial stages of development, of basic growth and formation, which goes through the mid-20s, it's much more vulnerable in that state. So you can tell the kids, you might see adults doing certain things, not advocating the adults starting to vape, but you might see adults doing certain things. You have to know. Just like in general, there is a difference between any chemical affecting the brain of an adult versus the brain of a child or a teenager. When it comes to vaping, they still will agree in the medical community that vaping is healthier, or better said, less dangerous or less unhealthy than smoking cigarettes. 
Although there's a lot of questions about that now because a lot there's a whole bunch of people who died from vaping related lung illness. That's actually an acronym now. That's its own illness category now. So it's not even so clear. We're only first learning about the 20 and 30 year marks of people vaping now because it's new. As opposed to in cigarettes, we have 100 years of data to be able to see full lifespans of what it does. We don't know where we're going to end up. The people vaping right now are actually the guinea pigs for us in 20 and 30 years to see well, what happens over the course of 40 or 50 years. A little scary. But even if it remains not as unhealthy as smoking cigarettes, being less unhealthy does not make it healthy, obviously. So sometimes teenagers will come with that type of like, well, no, this is so much healthier than smoking. Okay, I can think of lots of things that are healthier than something else, but they're still unhealthy and dangerous and bad for you. So just a simple, simple point to keep in mind. And nicotine also, unlike, let's say, caffeine, where there's a lot of discussion, there's more of a consensus amongst the, amongst the neuroscientists about nicotine that nicotine is not healthy for the teenage developing brain. So something to keep in mind with the nicotine as well. But the, the main thing I like to talk about is propylene glycol. Okay, let's talk about and any questions on vaping or on the mental health piece and how it interplays with substance abuse and the interventions, yeah. So I've been reading a lot about vin. On the gums? The like thing. The gum patches, yeah. yeah. There's nicotine, not vaping, not cigarettes, there's like these things. Yeah, or chewing nicotine gum. Right. You, know, you don't have to go so to the more new that? stuff with the patches, but there's, there's patches on the arm forever. How people quit smoking, they put patches on their arm, nicotine gum. I've yet to find teenagers that are really into that because there's usually such a strong uh, social component to these things that vaping looks cool and feels cool and you feel like you're doing something. They're like, well, you should really stop. I can't. I'm addicted to nicotine. Okay, here's the nicotine gum. Here's the nicotine patch. Put it on in the morning, set it, and forget it. You're done the whole day. You won't have a nicotine urge. No, I can't do that. Like, why? So it starts to bring out that there's something more to it than just the headache I get from lack of nicotine. So, you're, yeah, I, I think that we still have that argument. If, if there was a kid arguing, I want to use the patch, which again, I've never heard. But if there was a kid arguing, I'd like to use one of those nicotine vices that doesn't affect our, the lungs at all or the brain at all, outside of just nicotine, then th it would be much, again, not as bad. But still, there is research on the impact of nicotine on the developing brain. It's pretty widely agreed that once a person's beyond their mid-20s, nicotine is not an unhealthy substance, or it's similar to caffeine in its effect. It doesn't take away your ability to think at all. So there's, there's a lot of research on that, but for the developing brain, there's a lot of research on that it can still be unhealthy. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to alcohol. This is gonna be the, the focus of our presentation for tonight. We'll touch on marijuana and prescription medications as well. But when it comes to alcohol, anybody know what the chemical is in alcohol that affects a person's brain? Close, but you heard it from me earlier. Yeah, today. no, it's funny if I remember, right? <laughs> E-T-O-H. Okay. Uh, similar to ethanol. So E-T-O-H is actually the chemical, and I like to tell that to kids because Instead of just talking about it as like scotch and bourbon and beer and wine, all of them share something in common, E-T-O-H. It's a much more clinically sounding and accurate name for the chemical that's an alcohol that actually affects our bodies and brains. And it's a poison. And our body works furiously to try to excrete it through going to the bathroom much more frequently, through sweating more. And ultimately, if you keep drinking, despite all the sweat and going to the bathroom and it's not able to keep up through throwing up. So that is how the body reacts to ETOH, right? Again, I just, it, instead, of, instead of it being this common household name of whiskey or whatever, you call it that that's just the method, the fermentation of wheat and barley versus grapes versus sugar or whatever. Those are just the methods of developing ETOH to put into your system and put into your brain and body. So when it comes to alcohol, alcohol is also highly addictive, terrible withdrawal symptoms once a person becomes addicted. And obviously it alters our ability to think, through, think things through in a straight fashion. What do you think is the first bad decision that a person makes after they've begun drinking? Any ideas? Um, 
ideas? What's usually the first bad decision? To drink more. Exactly. How much should I drink? So somebody might come to the Purim Suda, and they might say, which we're going to have soon, and they might say, you know what, I'm only going to have two drinks or three drinks. I'm not going to, you know, once I mention Purim, I'll just say really quickly, there are many sources that say that no one has to drink on Purim. There are definitely sources that say that men should. Um, but, but there are sources that say not. In this country, the fact that it's illegal really for kids to have alcohol, you could argue maybe for a parent to give their child, but certainly, certainly for a parent to give someone else's child would be majorly problematic in terms of liability, <coughs> in terms of legality and all of that. So keep that in mind and spread the word. Um, you know, let parents make decisions for their own children. And some parents might make the decision to give them some alcohol, but the sources in the Torah and in the Talmud that talk about the idea of drinking, there are so many sources that talk about how embarrassing and disgusting and terrible it is to drink to the level of it being out of control, to the level of it being someone throwing up and getting sick from it. The Chazal, the Gemara, the Talmud talks about that in the terminology of shechruso shalot, which means comparing what that person is doing to the episode of Lot and his two daughters. The most disgusting, embarrassing episode in the Bible, in the Chumash, and that's generated through wine, through alcohol, and the rabbis are teaching us that's never okay. Never. That's always an embarrassment and terrible. So what does it mean that on Purim there should be a certain another level? It should be something that removes inhibitions for those that are going to go like the opinions that you should. There's plenty of plenty to warrant not touching alcohol at all on Purim completely, taking a nap, all sorts of other ways of doing it. You know, ask your, your rav, your rabbi. But if you're going to go with that opinion, it's only to the extent of releasing inhibitions to be able to be, be sing songs of thanking God and Hashem that you normally wouldn't sing and getting into the mood of, of kedusha, of holiness, of happiness and joy for being Jewish and for, for celebrating a Jewish holiday and all of these things. That's it. Nothing beyond that. Anything that's out of control and embarrassing people and, and then ultimately getting sick and throwing up, that's like an easy telltale sign that you just, you just went way overboard. So the first bad decision, as was mentioned, it could be at the perm meal, it could be on a Shabbos at a Kiddush, it could be in a shul, it could be at any random dinner, it could be any time. The first bad decision is, I went into this event thinking I'm going to drink X amount of drinks, and I feel pretty good right now, and, they don't realize this, my judgment is impaired, maybe I'll drink four instead of two. Hey, I feel even better now, and they don't realize my judgment is even more impaired. So now six seems like a good idea didn't, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So when, we, uh, when, when a person approaches drinking, they have to understand that they're getting into a situation that by definition, it creates an automatic cycle of taking it too far, which is why it's always smart for there to be someone to help on the side, not just with driving a car, but with how much alcohol should be available and how much to drink and all of that. So that's the first bad decision. And then obviously, taking away a person's perception creates all sorts of issues. So the lack of judgment affects driving a car also. Like, should I merge into this lane? I have one millimeter of space. Yeah, good idea. So you know, you're not going to think straight under the influence of alcohol. But then just the visual perception. How does everything seem straight? Am I balanced? Am I coordination and all of that? So obviously driving. It's not just driving, there are so many other activities that we do and there are injuries that happen uh, all the time. There are so many stories with, uh, there was once a, a kid who, there was a, uh, a Rebetzin, the wife of one of the rabbis, who she saw the kid was about to run into the street after one of his friends and there was a car coming. So she grabbed him back. It's actually, in that regard, a happy ending as opposed to other stories. Just grabbed his shirt back and he felt so upset, just out of control, out of his mind, that she did that. He turned around and swung and punched her in the face, and she was out. After that, he had to confront for the rest of his high school career that the wife of his rabbi was punched in the face by him, injured severely, had to recuperate, and he had to deal with that for the rest of his high school career because of one dumb decision due to alcohol. 
And there's countless, countless examples, and we'll watch a video about it. But one of the things that I do with the kids is I have these $160 goggles that are um, made with, with uh, real research in terms of the visual impairment. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of these. They are colloquially called as uh, drunk goggles. But basically, you put these goggles on um, afterwards. You're welcome to try. We paint a blue line on the floor. We time the kids to walk this line foot over foot like this all the way till the end. It takes 11 seconds, and then we give them the goggles. There's different levels. This one is like having seven or eight drinks, more than twice the legal limit of driving. So 0.08, this is up to 0.20. And uh, this one, which is about 0.08, so about the legal limit of just a little bit over. And so they get to try these different states of what it is like for your vision and your balance to be impaired. Um, we had some of the rabbis try it earlier today also. And it's quite scary. It actually causes you to feel dizzy. And some of the kids say, like, wow, this is what you feel like when you're drunk? And I'm like, well, that's a big part of it, yeah. Like, you're stumbling over yourself. Like, why would anyone ever want to do that? And the answer is that way before this level, there was some good feeling associated with it. But again, then comes the bad decision making and it quickly escalates to this. And the thought, and we have all high school kids try it, of driving a car with these goggles on is ridiculous. It would be impossible. So again, I'm not gonna have you all try it on now and make a fool out of yourselves in front of each other. But <laughs> afterwards, you can feel, feel free to try it out. Um, we also have them toss a ball to each other. So they'll toss ball, a ball to each other without the goggles on, it's very easy, eight feet apart. And then with the goggles on, it's a huge mess and things are breaking in the room and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so we try to make it interactive for them. It's a great thing. The reason I'm telling you is not to go spend $160 on these goggles. Your children just had this lesson today. Go home and ask them about it. It's such a fun, calm, nice conversation. Like, what were those goggles like? If they didn't try it themselves, what were you, who was trying it? What was it like? Show interest to, like, to get to the point of just planting those seeds. Nothing, no command, no, and that's why you better not drink, but rather, wow. And that gives you a whole new perspective on why it's so important not to get to that state of drunkenness, not to experiment with alcohol, certainly never to get into a car. If you or even you know your friend had not to get into the car, even if you're not the one driving, wow, what a powerful way of giving that lesson. What's your child going to say? No, it wasn't. <laughs> that you're making it totally not confrontational. Another tip for how to give these lessons over. OK, so when it comes to addiction in general, I like to show this little animation video. I show this to the kids today. I'll show it for you. Just give me a second here. I'm gonna have to turn this off again. That's it.
pretty intense way of portraying it, but also pretty accurate. Uh, it portrays both the concepts of tolerance and dependence in addiction. And so when a person is finding themselves using substances, alcohol, nicotine, also all the other substances we're discussing, marijuana, opiate, prescription medications, all of these medications and substances, when a person finds themselves using these, what happens is that the brain starts to develop a tolerance to them. It starts to affect them at less and less of a level over time. They need more and more, and the addiction cycle continues. The definition of addiction is that you're using it even though it's clearly harming your life in many different types of ways. So it's a powerful video. You can find this video on YouTube uh, under Addiction Animation if you want to review it or take a look at it. Um, I want to show you one more video. Okay, so just, just in terms of what we sometimes find. So this is an important lesson that is both applicable to people themselves struggling with, with substance abuse, alcohol addiction, overdoing it with alcohol, all of that, but also even for kids, teenagers, who are thinking to themselves, I'm never doing that. It's not anywhere near my train of thought. You might be surprised if all of a sudden something doesn't go well and this and then you find yourself in a position and one of your friends who you thought never does it is doing it, and it's like maybe all of a sudden it is. And things change really quickly with teenagers. But even if it's true that it never will be within their range of what they would consider doing, what messages are they getting from us, from the parents? And that's important for them to learn that if they see certain behaviors and activities, they don't have to, and this is the message I try to give over, they don't have to say, you know what, then I disrespect that person because they smoke or they do this or whatever we're gonna see. That's not what your approach needs to be. You're mature and old enough in the high school years to compartmentalize to say, you know what, there's so much I do respect and so much I do appreciate and so much that I, I want to learn from, but I'm not going to learn from that. And you can give that message over to children, but also the children need to know what's okay and what's not okay, what's normal, what's not normal, what, what they really shouldn't be learning from. So this is a pretty intense video. Let's take a look. Made by Emily Dillon.
time I watch it, even though this is the 200th time I watched it, bring tears to my eyes. It is a very powerful video in terms of actually being a pretty accurate reflection of reality. Um, obviously, it's presented in a pretty extreme fashion in terms of all the drinking that's going on, but kids learn from the decisions that we make. And part of what I want to teach children is that even if you're in a situation where you can't change something, you can still choose to learn from some things and not from others, and you can get help from, your, from a parent, from a teacher. You can say to a parent, is that okay? Instead of, of course that's okay, it's my father, brother, whoever doing that. Of course I'm assuming that's okay. One second. No, 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 you learned in school, it's not okay. Getting to the point of getting sick is never okay. On Purim or any day, that's not okay. And so that's, that's what we want to teach. We can teach that adults can responsibly enjoy alcohol in moderation. I don't think, in my opinion, in the opinion of Amudim, we do not have to advocate that nobody ever touch alcohol ever again. But it has to be with the understanding that A, it's always within moderation, so nothing like this in terms of the messaging we're giving our children and what they may end up doing. But also, we have to make sure that we're not uh, giving the, the children the wrong messages. Um, the wrong messages of what does it mean to do, to do such a thing as an adult? And how do we really, what do we really focus on in life? And that I think is one of the biggest messages when it comes to alcohol that we can find. Is one of my colleagues told over a story of a father who came home and he realized afterwards how terrible this was, but he came home from an overseas business trip. And he came home and he told his family, I'm so sorry, it was a successful trip, thank God, but I wasn't able to pick up souvenirs from that place. And then later that day, a friend of that father's came over and he was showing off the bottle he was able to get duty free at the airport for you know the very expensive bottle for much cheaper. How much of the Shabbos meal, how much of the Purim meal, how much of any time that, that there's alcohol involved, how much per percentage of the conversation is revolving around the pedigree and the age and the origin and the notes and all of that. Doesn't mean you can't appreciate the wine or even the scotch, but it shouldn't be more than like a minute of conversation. Like, that's nice. Like, how long would you talk about this new flavor of Dr. Pepper they made? That's the same amount of time you can talk about the scotch. It wouldn't be the focus of conversation the whole entire meal. If the, if the idea is that for the adults in moderation, the alcohol is there just as an enhancement in moderation to what's happening at the meal, to the Torah that's being spoken, and the songs that are being sung, and the family time together, that's one thing. But if it's the opposite, if the meal is really just the pretext to be able to drink, that's where it becomes a problem. Even where the alcohol is stored, I don't want to nitpick, but it can sometimes send a message. If, if there's, a, there's a beautiful showcase of the bottles, and that shows literally how you're putting them on a pedestal, if it's just in a cabinet somewhere, maybe preferably locked, if you know your children, but if it's just in a cabinet somewhere and once in a while you will take it out and use it and put it back, similar to what you would do with the soda or whatever, so then you're putting it in its place. Just to be conscious of these, uh, these messages that we may be giving our children. Okay, so I don't know if we were expected to end at 8.30 or not. I'm gonna assume we were, so we're late already. I try never to go late. I just wanna say, Two quick points on marijuana and prescription <coughs> medications, and then I'll open it up to questions. So when it comes to marijuana, the main chemical in marijuana is THC. There is way more THC in the genetically modified marijuana plants than there ever was in the 1960s and 70s. And it has been causing psychosis and mental breakdowns and mental health issues to be triggered in children. That means that children smoke or vape marijuana or eat candies and gummies that have THC in it or eat brownies and chocolate chip cookies that have THC in the mix and in the ingredients. So be aware of all of those options these days. And the THC affects their brain. It's a psychoactive chemical. We're not gonna get into all the, the neurology on that, but the bottom line is that it does alter the brain chemistry and the brain functionality. And for some kids, and you don't know who it is, so it's called genetics and predispositions, it actually can cause sometimes as terrible as a psychotic breakdown that you can tell that that happened 
years later, and sometimes it can bring onset of anxiety disorders and paranoid schizophrenic disorders and, and depressive disorders and all sorts of things. Marijuana is, a, is not a simple substance in terms of when kids ask, well, what's the difference between marijuana and alcohol? Why should one be legal and one not? So first of all, in terms of legal, it's a silly question because there's economics and politics involved. So it has nothing to do necessarily really with just the health of it. They tried to outlaw alcohol for three years. Why did they bring it back again? Not because they discovered a new study that it's actually healthy for you because it was economically impossible and causing crime. So you see all these different equations and considerations when it comes to legality. So let's stay away from legality, but why is one worse than the other? The one thing I can tell you is moderate alcohol consumption, and I mean responsible and moderate, has been shown over many, many, many years, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, to not negatively impact the general course of a person's life. Whereas moderate marijuana consumption already is being shown to definitely alter the course of a person's life in a healthy way. In the emergency rooms in Colorado, which was the first state to legalize marijuana, they now, the data is coming up five, six years later about the huge increase in marijuana-related admittance to the emergency room for illnesses and discomforts and problems associated with marijuana consumption that they never had before. Because all of a sudden, a lot of people were using it. So we have to understand not just the gateway drug argument. You're going to end up doing cocaine and heroin. Oh, so the marijuana's fine though? That's like a really hard argument for a teenager to hear. Yeah, marijuana's fine, but you're gonna end up doing, no I won't. Now it's true, nobody in the history of doing marijuana ever started with it and said, and this will be my first step towards cocaine. No one ever said that. No one ever said in the history of addiction, I am now going to have my first shot of alcohol, and this is my first step towards becoming addicted. No one ever says that. So. Obviously, all the people who become addicted and all the people that progress to harder drugs started not thinking that way at all. I'm pretty convinced that they wouldn't go in those directions. Unfortunately, my colleague and I moved him just buried a teenage, older teenage boy who overdosed from heroin after working with this kid for years from when they were only 12 and 13, and they started with marijuana at that age and promised it's always only going to be marijuana. An anecdote, but an anecdote of many, unfortunately. So. We have to understand the dangers associated with, right now, the dangers of marijuana, not just that it can lead to things in the future. And then finally, prescription medication. So I really have one main advice when it comes to this, prescription medications like painkillers, prescription painkillers, like when it comes to codeine and Percocet and Vicodin and these types of painkillers that doctors will sometimes prescribe after procedures and surgical procedures and major injuries, sometimes are necessary, follow the doctor's advice. If the person starts to feel better, we, we have cases at Amundin where these were upstanding people in the community, men and women, who never considered abusing alcohol, marijuana, nothing, no smoking, and then they got an injury and the doctor said, take it. The doctor told me to take it. Like, they're straight shooters. They took it and it started to affect them. They start to feel certain things and they start to develop tolerance and they start to use it even when not so much prescribed and one becomes one every five hours, four hours, and then it becomes two and it becomes more. And it can be very problematic. It can be all of a sudden this very innocent entryway into abusing hardcore drugs because they're based in opiates, which is like heroin. So my advice is anytime you are prescribed these medications, if the doctor is telling you to take it, take it. But as soon as you start to feel the pain getting better, don't just keep taking the rest of the prescription because that's what the doctor wrote on the label. <coughs> Ask the doctor, consult with your doctor. Should I still take it? I'm feeling this much better. This is my pain, one to 10. And whenever the prescription's over, whether it's at that point or the doctor tells you to keep taking it for a little bit, whenever it's done, throw them out. Don't keep them in the medicine cabinet. That's where kids are gonna look for them. Okay, so you put them in that other drawer in the vanity of the bathroom. That's where kids are gonna look for them. They will find them. With whichever bathroom of the house it's in, where whichever cabinet of the house it's in, they will stumble upon them. They might have a friend who thought about these things, and they never thought about these things. And the friend says, hey, did you notice what you have in your bathroom? He's like, what? Just, just throw them out. There's no reason to have them. Because as soon as you might, may need them in the future, God forbid, you call a doctor and he prescribes them for you again. Okay, so it takes a few hours to get it, instead of having it already in the house. These things have expiration dates anyway. Throw them out. It's the best thing you can do, because the biggest danger with prescription meds 
in terms of how dangerous they could be, is that they are potentially the most easily stumbled upon. It's very unlikely that a child will stumble upon a bag of weed in your medicine cabinet, but much more likely they may stumble upon one of these bottles of pills. So that's, that's the main thing that I would say about prescription medications. And the bottom line is, like we started with, we want to always make sure to foster these open communication levels with our children, being armed with the facts that I'm presenting to you. The recording will go out. Uh, in terms of understanding these different drugs and chemicals and how bad they can be for people even now, not just later, so that you can plant these positive seeds, tell the kids these, these points. But not in the midst of an argument, just like, oh, I just read something interesting, heard something interesting about marijuana, and everything's fair game for us to talk about. We can talk about anything, and it's always not judgmental. One last tip I'll leave you with. Sometimes it's really hard to talk to a kid directly about something, Maybe you shouldn't be friends with that person. You know, maybe you shouldn't be using that substance. Whatever the conversation is, sometimes a powerful tool can be to talk around the child instead of talking to the child. What that means or what that looks like is husband and wife are in the kitchen just off the living room. Child is in the living room on the couch. Husband and wife talk purposely a little bit louder than they normally would, but not obviously. And talk about how serious it is. I mean, you read this, and yeah, I watched a YouTube thing on that, and, I heard from, from somebody of this and saying real good points and the kids hearing what the two of you are talking about. When it's not said to him, many times the seeds can be planted and hopefully bear fruit sooner than later, as opposed to when it's more confrontational, like I need to tell you something about this. And right away the defenses go up. There's one last tip I wanted to leave you with and with that I'll open up to questions if there are anyone, any, and thank you so much for coming.